simply connected domain. But uh, let me tell you about another type of a domain which is called multiply connected domain. Uh, a domain D is multiply connected domain if it is not it is not a simply connected domain it is not a simply connected domain so uh, obviously in case of simply connected domain you, you never had this situation that uh, this is the simply connected domain that if you take any contour within its side inside of this domain that can be and that encloses only the points of the domain d but if you have this kind of situation you have a this type of hole here in this domain then such a domain is not a simply connected domain you know why it's not a simply connected domain because uh, any of the points lying within the interior of this uh, contour by uh, red contour uh, they are not the part of the domain d and if you take any contour inside if you take any contour here for example this one then this contour doesn't enclose the points only points of d it encloses the points also which are not part of d for example these points these are not the part of the domain d so such 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 uh, domains uh, of kind of a ring shaped domain they are not simply connected so they are multiply connected domains indeed any domain which has holes in it is a multiply connected domain so this but uh, now what we are going to talk about we are going to talk about uh, cauchy theorem on such domains Cauchy theorem on multiply connected domains and how we are going to talk about it uh, is uh, you will uh, just a minute let me let me clear this okay so we have this domain suppose you have this third kind of domain and now the situation is like uh, uh, yeah this is the domain and now uh, suppose you have to apply the Cauchy theorem and uh, uh, obviously this domain it has two bound boundary components and its boundary is let uh, d uh, boundary of d has two components let the one component be a contour c1 and another component b contour c2 and to see the domain part uh, the orientation of these contours uh, you 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 must remember that how you choose the orientation when you are traversing the path of the contour your domain must lie to the left of your side so the orientation with this the outer orientation of outer contour has to be anti-clockwise and uh, so the and uh, orientation of the inner domain the inner inner contour will be clockwise okay that's right and what we are going to suppose now uh, let me for the time suppose uh, let me take r uh, to be a domain d union its boundary then remember r is a region what is a region and a, a domain is a open and connected set and region is a connected set it is a open connected but it might contain its boundary points also are a boundary so that this is a region region and suppose that uh, f is analytic f is analytic in r when i say that f is analytic r means it extends uh, continuously or it extends analytically to the boundary uh, yeah you must say that it is uh, analytic in the domain but it is continuous on the boundary or if you want to avoid this situation also you we may we may consider that these contours are in the 
domain or within the domain t like this also if you have a bigger domain if you have a domain like this and you may consider this contour to be within this then how you are going to prove this program? see uh, because uh, uh, if i now consider contour c and let's c is equal to c1 union c2 this is a contour also this is now a union of contours this is not actually a contour now because contour has to be connected part and now i want to apply theorem on uh, I want to calculate the integral of this function f over this c, over this path c. But now you have a path which is a disconnected path. So then, what you what you are going to do? You just join these contours to a straight line. Then what will be your path? You just start from this point here in from the inner path and move in this way, just uh, clockwise, and then you exit this through this line and then you reach the outer contour and you traverse this in anti-clockwise direction and then you come back through same line and reach to the point here from from DJ to the point from where you started now with this you form a closed contour now this is a closed contour and now you see the part this one let me, let me uh, highlight this part this part now this is a region which is now a simply connected region this is a region now which is a simply connected region because of this line this line separated the part this is a simply connected region now and if it is a simply connected region and uh, uh, this line let me let me denote this line by gamma but uh, note that this gamma is being traveled twice first is it, it is being traveled as gamma and, and the next time it is being traveled in the opposite direction so it has to be this so now c now you know you can see this c now this c is a contour it is a simple closed contour indeed now. It is a simple closed contour. Or you might just use as a contour, even if you, you it is not simple, but here it looks like a it's a simple contour now. So now if it is a simple contour now, and the region enclosed by this contour is a simply connected region, and therefore we can apply the Cauchy's theorem on simply connected regions therefore by cauchy gorsa theorem cauchy gorsa theorem for simply connected domain simply connected domains what you will have you have the value of the integral of the analytic function f on c to be equal to zero but this integral can be written in the form of four other integrals depend because this c is made up of four components first is c1 but remember the orientation of c1 is negative so the sign of integration with c1 has to be negative so i can write but integral c f z dz is equal to integral over c1 and since the orientation of this c1 is negative so the sign has to be negative with it and another part is c2 and another part of it is the line joining these two contours and the another part is uh, negative minus of fz dz um, but minus of fz dz you can write it as uh, uh, let, let me write it in a, now it is c2 fz dz minus c1 fz dz and plus integral over gamma fz dz 
and just note here that negative if, if you if you change the orientation of this negative of minus of comma you, you have to you have to take the sign minus here it has to be minus of gamma fz dz so what you will have now you will have this these two terms cancelling each other and what you are left with only you are left with only c2 over f of z dz minus integral c1 fz dz and this is your uh, right hand side but what was the left hand side left hand side is a zero so left hand side is a zero implies that you have you will have integral over c2 fz dz is equal to integral over c1 fz dz so this is very important property of uh, if you have that you deduced here that integral over these two contours have the same value that means if you have this kind of situation you have a function which is analytic in this domain and if you have a, if you want to calculate the integral over this particular contour what you can do you, you take another contour which is simpler to handle because sometimes to compute the value of this integral you might need the parameterization of this uh, contour c1 or c2 but if for example suppose you have a c or c2 and c1 and suppose uh, uh, c1's parameterization is uh, not uh, uh, computable uh, from your side or someone who is computing it and c2 handling c2 is much easier then you can use this uh, result this conclusion that because the integral over this c1 is same as the integral over c2 so you just compute integral over c2 so this is also a version of the cauchy's theorem this is also known as cauchy's deformation theorem some people call it but it is also called cauchy's theorem for annular regions also and uh, this is also because uh, the, uh, any region which is a ring shaped region is called an annular region or a region or a simply connected multiply connected domains you may also call them so this was this was the case when the domain has one hole but this can be generalized this can be generalized to any any domain which has uh, not only two holes which has too many holes okay, here it has a hole you have a, you have a hole here which has which has holes of this time so then what you what you will how you will compute the integral then then you can you will have uh, this let this outside with c and uh, suppose these are c1 about each hole you have a contour c2 uh, c3 c4 c5 so then what you can do uh, uh, if you look at the orientation outside orientation has to be anti-clockwise and inside orientation has to be clockwise it has to be clockwise every every every, every smaller contour will have clockwise orientation in this way so then what you will do in the same way as, as we did it we connect it by this line and let it be connected by this line this line connected with this line connect it with and reach to here then every such line the uh, contribution of every integral the like, contribution of the integral over each lines will be cancelled out because each line will be traversed twice and then what you will have you will have integral over c fz dz will be equal to integral over all these uh, contours uh, from all these smaller contours are the contour within this baker contour but the contour within this baker contour will become to will be equal to the sum of the integrals over all these contours because uh, their orientation being negative and the sign will be negative and so with the help of negative sign you can shift the integral to the right hand side and you will have this to be equal to j2 uh, let it be you have n minus one holes here it will be integral over each of cj fz dz 
So this can be this can be generalized to any number of folds, finite number of folds in a domain D. So this way we have now all the all the all the required information about Cauchy theorem that for any type of domain we have a Cauchy theorem, a version of a Cauchy theorem which holds true. Is it okay? Yeah, do you have any question about it? No, sir. So then Cauchy's theorem it's almost uh, we don't have anything now left for Cauchy's theorem. Uh, but now we will have some consequences of simple connectivity. Uh, but uh, before that, let, uh, I'm, I'm just stating the result uh, of the existence of the antiderivative, the proof of which uh, for star-like domains we have done in one of the previous lectures. But here I'm going to state this result. And uh, if you are interested, you can see the Churchill's book. And there it is, the proof of it is given. And what is the proof is that let fz be analytic analytic function on domain D on a simply connected domain D then there exists an analytic function there exists an analytic function capital F on D such that f of z is equal to derivative of f of z is equal to f of z so this is the existence of antiderivative and if you uh, the proof of this theorem uses the Cauchy's theorem for simply connected domains and you can see it's proof it, 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 the technique used here is almost same uh, that has been the way it, it was done for the what do you say Cauchy's theorem for uh, what you say for uh, star-like domains, and the, and the approach. Let me let me just brief you about it. Uh, what is being done here is the outline. Uh, you have a simply connected domain. Then then a function is defined like this. This actually capital F is defined as a function. This capital F is defined as f of z as an integral over z naught to z, where z naught is uh, some fixed point in this domain t. z naught is a fixed point here, f of z dz. This is defined in this way. And then, then the only thing that remains to show here is that this function is well defined. And uh, you have to mention what is the path of integration from z naught to z, because this is a simply connected domain. and. Uh, uh, any uh, and even if it is a domain, so you can you can choose any path, any path uh, from z naught to z. You can choose any path from z naught to z. And then to show that it is path independent, this integral is path independent. That will uh, that will that will be sufficient to establish that this capital F is a well defined function. Then for that, what you have to do, uh, you suppose you you are, you take this value of the integral along two different paths. Then what happens? Suppose you have another path. You have this way. Then what you can do? Suppose this is something c1. This is c2. Then mm, the negative of this blue path is minus of c1. And you you consider then then if you consider uh, if you consider c as c2 union minus c1, then it becomes a closed path. It comes a, comes a closed path, and it is a simple closed path in the simply connected domain D. And then over this closed path, you will have the value of the integral equal to zero. Value of the integral f z d z will be equal to zero. And uh, since C is composed of two paths, then you can write it as integral over C two f z d z. And since uh, the orientation of C1 is negative, so it is C1 fz dz. So uh, this being equal to zero implies that both the integrals will be equal. That means this is a path independent integral, whether you take path of integration via whatever path you take. The path, the only thing is that your path needs to be from z naught to z. This way, the, this function will be 
well defined function then the only thing that you have to show you have to just show that this is a mm, differentiable function and the technique will be used as a same technique then. but i'm not going to much deeper into you can see if you are interested but you you just first keep in mind that okay this is the result that antiderivative of an analytic function exists at a primitive you also call it as a primitive exists on a simply connected domain and this is the final result for simply connected domain now as a consequence of this theorem we have two beautiful results and they have very good applications in complex analysis the first result is the existence of the exponential that uh, suppose f uh, uh, defined on a domain is analytic and it should not be a vanishing function analytic and derivative of uh, so did not derivative the function itself f of z should not be equal to zero for any so it is a non vanishing function it doesn't have zero and d let me take and d is a simply connected domain d is a simply connected domain then there exists an analytic function there exists an analytic function h on d such that exponential of h is equal to f see this is uh, this is what uh, happens in real numbers also that if you, you if a number is a non zero number then that number can be written as a power of uh, as exponential of some number and this is what here uh, in uh, complex analysis happens also if you have a non vanishing analytic function on a simply connected domain then that a non vanishing analytic function is a exponential of some analytic function see how 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 proof of it we are going to do see you have an analytic function f when you have an analytic function f on a simply connected domain then uh, it is uh, the theorem that i state that it will have anti derivative but here i am not going to find the anti derivative of f i am going to find the anti derivative of an another function uh, since f is analytic and it is given that uh, it is a non vanishing function it doesn't have any zero so derivative of f z upon f of z is analytic but remember here the only thing that i am assuming is that uh, the derivative of this function is an analytic function this is what i am assuming but uh, okay it will be also clear when we, we will be doing cauchy's integral formula but uh, uh, since derivative is analytic denominator f is analytic it is non vanishing so it is analytic on whole of domain d and d is a simply connected domain therefore the previous theorem there exists its center derivative there exists an analytic function there exists an analytic function h such that the derivative of this analytic function is equal to f upon this is the empty derivative now what we are going to do, uh, uh, keep this in mind and uh, now let me define a function g of z is equal to exponential of minus h dot f and uh, actually i have to show that f is equal to exponential of h but anyway uh, first uh, note that this is product of analytic function so g is analytic g is analytic on whole of the domain d and what is its derivative d 
derivative of g at z what is its derivative its derivative is uh, uh, minus of derivative of h at z into exponential of minus h z f of z plus e to power minus h z you are using the product rule f prime z so this is equal to uh, minus h prime of z f of z plus f prime of z into e to power minus h of z is it okay now what is h prime of z h prime of z is uh, you have h prime of z is derivative of f of f at z upon f of z into f of z and since f z and f z they are non zero you can cancel them and it will be cancelled out and you will be left with minus fz plus fz and it will be zero so this function is zero that means the derivative of g is zero for every point in domain d and since the domain d it is zero that means the function is constant this implies that g is constant g is a constant now let let me fix uh, c in d be uh, fixed uh, then for any g is a constant okay we don't have any trouble then for any uh, z in d i will have g of z is equal to g of c this is a constant function we got to know that this is a constant function now just a second this implies uh, what is g what was the definition of g definition of g was f of z into e to power minus h of z is equal to g of c which implies that from here you have f of z equals to you shift the e to power minus z to the right hand side you will have e to power h of z times g of c now look at g of c g of c is not equal to 0 it's not 0 because g of c has to be e to power minus h of c dot f of z to so e to power something is never 0 and f of z is not 0 by hypothesis so g of z is not equal to 0 therefore it is a non zero complex number uh, so it is a non zero complex number i can write it as e to power minus yeah, i can write it as not minus i can write it as Okay, it should be remote. I can write it to power some k. Uh, why? Why I can write because uh, uh, look at this exponential function. Exponential function is a onto function from c c to c minus zero. It doesn't assume the zero. It uh, it assumes every value. So g of c is a non-zero value. So it g of c has to be image of some. Uh, complex number k under exponential so g of c has to be e to power k and this implies that f of z has to be equal to e to power h of z plus some complex number k and this is the required form you can write it is e to power h z in hypothesis i have denoted it by small of h but the only thing is that f of z needs to be exponential of some analytic function so this this proves here that this this capital h is a uh, small h plus k and small h is analytic k is a constant so h plus k is a relative hence this capital h is an analytic function and this is proved now that f is exponential of an analytic function so this is this is very general thing for non vanishing analytic function on simply connected domains but this is this is very vital here we have used it simple connected domains and what about arbitrary domains uh, if, if it is domain is not uh, simply connected then may, we may not have that kind of privilege that the function is analytic function is exponential of some analytic function but locally it is possible when we say that locally suppose you have this kind of domain which is not simply connected when we say that locally, locally means uh, you have the point here uh, and you can draw a disk about this point which lies within the domain D because domain is an open set. And then over this disk, you might have this function as exponential of some analytic 
function because this disk is a simply connected domain. Every disk is a simply connected domain. And another immediate uh, consequence uh, of uh, this theorem is the existence of a square root function of a non-zero, non-vanishing function. And uh, uh, assume we are assuming the same hypothesis. Assume the hypothesis of theorem one. Then it says that what is that? What are the hypotheses of theorem one? That f is an analytic function on a simply connected domain, and it is a non-vanishing analytic function. Then it says that there is an analytic function. There is an analytic function g on domain D such that g square is equal to f. That means you can say that uh, a non-vanishing analytic function f is the square root of some analytic function here. And the proof is not a big thing here. It's not a big challenge. It's a very simple thing yeah, because you know that uh, f is analytic, f is non-vanishing on simply connected domain. And by theorem one, that we just proved that f is an exponential f is exponential of some analytic function. So by previous theorem, by previous theorem, I can write f of z as exponential of some h of z, where h is analytic function on D, where h is analytic on domain D. Now, what, what is define G? Define G, define G as e to power h of z half for z in domain D then clearly g is also analytic and what is what is the square of g look at the g squared z has to be exponential of h of z and which is nothing but f of z and this is the proof here. we don't we don't we do not require much effort here to prove the square root to prove that it is the square root of some analytic function or uh, it is not square root uh, uh, if square root exists because uh, uh, square root of f is equal to g and note here that square root is also a non-vanishing function so this this is this is very important consequence that uh, on simply connected domain square root of every non-vanishing analytic function exists that means uh, the, the another important thing to notice in these two theorems is that they functions both the function both the theorem the function is non-vanishing that means the problem happens when you have uh, points in the domain d in a simply connected domain d where the function is zero function is vanishing and zeros will have a very good role special special zeros have a very good role in the study of identity functions i think uh, we have uh, this much of stuff for today and uh, I have put up some exercises also in the notes and I will post them today only. And you can you can work out those ex exercises by applying the Cauchy's theorem and Cauchy's theorem for these annular regions also. And so if you have any questions, kindly you can ask. Bully. Thank <laughs> you.